OK, I'll talk, I'll talk loud. I'm going to use the blackboard. So if some of you are over there, you might want to come closer. Yes, but I'm also going to use I'm also going to use the screen. Um, I'm going to do a symplectic combination. OK. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be in Pisa, and especially for this occasion. So, uh, well, uh, Lagrange, uh, clearly, from this uh, conference, was a uh, general mathematician. He was one of these very few people who could do both algebra and analysis. Uh, he covered absolutely everything, one of these uh, or can I say overarching mathematicians who understand all of mathematics of their time. They say Poincaré was a time, Hilbert as well. I am not. I am a specialist. I work in mostly in variational, calculus of variations, variation and analysis. So are most of us who are specialists. So each of us sees one aspect of Lagrange. I cannot see all aspects. So for me, Lagrange is the calculus of variations. And the question now is, 200 years after Lagrange, what has happened to the calculus of variations? Now, the answer seems to be obvious. Lagrange, Euler, they dealt with one-dimensional problems. One-dimensional meaning one-dimensional in time. And now we have had the Dirichlet integral, Riemann, now we deal with multidimensional problems with calculus variation. It's no longer time downstairs, it's x1, xn, and we get the Dirichlet integral, the Laplace equation, harmonic maps, we get also minimal surfaces. We're, this all comes from Lagrange. And now we also have more complicated things. You have several variables downstairs, and several variables upstairs. Now you have really multidimensional calculus variations, you have continuum mechanics, so we are far away from Lagrange, e even though we all know that the first thing we do is to look at the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we're seemingly very far away. My point in this talk is to say, no, no, no. We, they are still very simple problems, one-dimensional problems and calculus variations that we do not know how to solve. At least we don't know the necessary conditions. In other words, it's wrong to have forgot in the one-dimensional calculus variations there are problems which Lagrange would have understood, which Lagrange would have solved, and which I still find baffling. I'm going to give an example of that. And it is not an academic example, if you open a textbook in macroeconomics, chapter 1, section 1, it always begins with growth theory, the Ramsey model of growth theory. The Ramsey model of growth theory is a one-dimensional problem in the calculus of variation, and from the mathematical point of view, it is, shall we say, treated at least sloppily. However, it's a basic tool for economics. I myself am now working on climate change and sustainable development. I use that model and I found that the conditions uh, that economists use are simply not mathematically well grounded. So here we have a very important problem that we do not really fully understand. I'm going to show it to you. So I have two apologies to make. The first one is you can understand that as a criticism of Lagrange. This guy did not do his job. I mean, you should really be able to look up and say, oh yes, this is a necessary condition. Here's a problem, we don't know the necessary condition. Why? What did he do? Why did he become a senator and all that instead of working? So that's um, one criticism. It's be much better to criticize Lagrange than to criticize oneself. And the other one is, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot my laptop at home, <laughs> with the slides, with two effects. Effect number one, I did not have time to finish the slides. And effect number two, so they are in an unfinished stage, so you will see it. 
And uh, so, uh, with two effects, uh, yeah, so that's the main effect. However, right, after a long conversation with my wife uh, and so on, uh, at a distance, getting hurt and so on, I have the former state of my slides, and you see, unwittingly, so here they are, yeah, so here they are, and the second apology that it begins like that, so it is in an uh, it is an unwittingly propaganda for the software I'm using, right? So the first slide should really be like that. Title, Lagrange and Karate Odori, with the name of the author. And in particular, I want to mention that some of the more recent results are in collaboration with Yiming Long. And this will be the second part. And a Chinese postdoc, which was hosted by IHES, thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, Chin Long Zhu. Okay. But on the other hand, if you don't want to use tech and you still want to make beautiful Beamer presentation, you can use this software and for a small fee I'll tell you how to get it. Uh, so, Zoom, Mostra Ricordi, Visual Pagina, Finestra, Ridute le Finestre, no, Nuove Finestra, how do you get the, how do you get the full screen? Sorry? Full screen, where do you get it? Sorry? F5. No. No, that's okay. Anyway, you see it. Oh, yeah, it's the right. Okay. So, first slide then. Okay. So, here's the Ramsey problem. Now, first thing Ramsey is the Ramsey. Frank Ramsey. Died, I think, 25 years old or 27. The guy who did combinatorics, who was in Cambridge with Keynes and so on. And after a conversation with Keynes, he came up with the first model of economic development. So this is classical, and as I told you, if you, are ever in, if you open a book on macroeconomics, this is what you see in chapter one. So the statement is the following. You want to maximize an integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus delta t, with a e to the minus delta t, of u of c of t. Now, if you, if you don't know, and so, uh, now, if you see why he's throwing up on the control at us, just see that if you, you, this is the equation. Now, look here. If I'm going to write here later on, c of t equals dk, uh, c of t equals f of k minus dk over dt. So if you substitute here f of k minus dk over dt, you get the classical problem, the calculus of variations. Right? Is it clear to everyone? So this problem is going to be equivalent to the following one. Integral from so 0 to infinity of e to the minus delta t u of f of k minus k dot dt, k of 0 equals k0, so it is a problem in the calculus of variations. No problem. One dimension, everything. Perhaps I write sloppily, and in the tradition of Newton, I write k dot for dk over dt. So I'm looking at this problem. And this is how what is stated, and certainly Lagrange could have understood that problem. The effect of e to the minus delta t is to make this guy finite. And certainly my claim is Lagrange should, I could have explained this problem to Lagrange. What is the economic interpretation? Now the economists write it that way. They keep it that way. By the way, f and u are given. f is 
is like that. And you, well, you can be like that. Or it can also be like that. So you have the SM sutra here. And the economic interpretation of that is I have an economy and I want to develop. This equation, K is capital. C is consumption. Now, if you want, and uh, now, if you have f of k is called the production function. So at time t, if your, capi you, uh, if your capital is k, you can produce f of k. <coughs> then the product, and you let's multiply everything by dt. You get dk change in capital equals f of k dt minus ct dt. So you produce f of k dt. So here is what the economy has produced. What do you do with it? You can eat it and you can save it. And clearly the dynamics of an economy means that once you have produced something, you can invest it or you can consume it now. So this is the balance. Investment equals production minus consumption. U is a utility. How much utility you derive from consumption? You do not derive utility from capital, right? You're not going to eat locomotives or uh, computers. You derive utility from the consumption. So this utility you derive from consumption and e to the minus delta t is here because if, I'm, if you want to give me uh, two million dollars, I prefer to have it now than two years from now. Now, this is an excellent problem in calculus of variations. You see, because what are your solutions? First solution, I eat immediately. I eat everything right now. If I eat everything, then k goes down to zero. Now, f of zero equals zero. If I eat everything, I go down to f equals zero. No more capital. Then nothing more to eat because, right? Think of capital as the harvest. This means you have seeds for the harvest. F of k is your harvest. You can you have set up some part aside to have a new harvest and you can eat something or you can eat it now. If you eat everything or the corn, then there's nothing left and you, and you die next year. The other thing is keep everything. Let's keep all the corn and sow it again. This is wonderful. And if you do it for 10,000 years, you're going to have enormous harvests. But you're not going to live in the meantime. You're just going to die. So it's a very good problem the calculus variations. And this is the classical Ramsey problem. Fine. Okay. Now let's skip. There's the question about existence. Existence, yeah, you can, tr by the way, just in case, K has to be positive, C has to be positive. And this is, a, this is expressing the fact that I cannot eat everything. It has to be positive. If C can be a negative, I die. Okay, now existence. Existence is nasty. I mean, I'm writing, you can introduce a sub space, do nasty things. Certainly not uh, something that Lagrange could have understood, and certainly not the master student can understand, uh, at least in three uh, uh, bachelor students can understand. Nasty, forget about it. So what do you do? Euler equation. So let me show you the problem again. Here it is. I try. Euler equation. Now, and I'm now an old crocodile in this job, but uh, I know, and very strange for me, I've never been able to remember an equation. I don't remember the heat equation, for instance. I never know it's plus or minus. The only equation I remember are Euler Lagrange. I took pains to remember that there's no minus sign here. So this is the only equation that I know by heart. Every other equation I have to check. Which is a handicap for doing math, I can tell you, but it's that way. So let's written that. This is the Lagrange equation. I think Lagrange was the first guy to write them. So what do they tell you? Well. 
you write that and you simplify of course by e to the minus delta t and it gives you this equation what is c well c is f of k minus dk over dt c is that so if i substituted c equals f of k minus dk i would get the second order equation but i don't do that i just keep c and i throw in the other equation, which means instead of writing a second order equation, I write a two first order equations. And now let me write the phase space, which you will find again in every textbook of economics. So here's the phase space, here is K downstairs, here is C downstairs, and you see that U double prime, oh, this guy is always positive. So this is positive. So DC over DT is positive or negative according to the fact that F prime of K is bigger or lesser than delta. So let us put here let us write here the curve C equals F of K. Let's write here the point K bar where F prime of K bar equals delta. So you know that DC over DT is positive in one region and negative in the other. It's positive here and negative there. This is the point defined by F prime of K low equals delta. So positive, negative. This is even simpler. dk over dt equals f of k minus c. So this is positive here and negative there. So you have a phase space and it's extremely easy to write down the solution. What you get is that So here is the point f prime of k bar equals delta, c equals f of k bar, and it is a fixed point, and it is hyperbolic. And then the field looks like that. I am pretty sure that Lagrange could have understood this. So these are all the solutions of the Euler equation. Question, where is the optimal solution? The optimal solution, well, you know that K0 equals K0. So you're starting, say, from here. So this is your starting point. So which is the optimal solution? Is it that one? Is it that one? Is it that one? Is it that one? Well, nothing special here. We all know it's a two-point boundary value problem. Right? Here is the first, where is the, where, what is the other value? Now every textbook will tell you, obviously, the right solution is that one. That is the optimal solution. It is, you start from here, you go on the stable manifold and you stay there. So you go here and you approach it. And if I want to tell now the optimal solution is a function of t. It will go as follows. Now, here is t, here is k. That is the point k bar defined by f prime of k bar equal delta. 
If you start from k0, you get this. So, and uh, in economic textbooks, they will tell you for any initial point, the economy will converge to an equilibrium defined by f prime of k bar equal delta. And what is remarkable is that the equilibrium does not depend on the utility. It depends only on the production. So what your, what your utility is, is not important. So it's very fundamentally economic. Very obviously a very simple models. But in economics, no one trusts complicated models. You just want to have a rough idea to see how things work. So very nice and dandy, except I don't know how to prove it. Economists know, but I don't. Right? Here is what is called the transversality condition at, uh, at infinity. The economists use the fact that this is what they call the transversality condition at infinity, the limit. So among all solutions, the optimal solution is the one that satisfies that. Okay, lots of work on that. Uh, I mean, I'm not mentioning the work of economists and so on. Philippe Michel wrote a very good paper in 1982. I myself worked on it. Camille Gachiva recently worked on it again, but uh, I'm not sure they applied the present situation. Right? I, they, I, I understand the stupid they applied, but not to that one. So the question, well, here I say Lagrange did not do his work. What in a problem like that? In a problem like the one I wrote, in an infinite horizon problem, what is the convenience at infinity? Now, let me raise the stakes. Now, if you go to two dimensions, I mean, take Dirichlet, take now partial differential equations, have something at infinity when you have integral to infinity. I don't know the condition at infinity. It's usually hidden under the carpet. You take an appropriate subval of space, which is fine. But if you want to express it like a boundary condition, infinity behavior solution at infinity, right? If you want to express it, in other words, if you want to express it as a partial differential equation with some kind of behavior at infinity, then I don't know how to do it. And if you look at Hamilton Jacobi, you have the same problem. When you have infinite domains, they tell you it is the solution of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation which grows less fast. Fine. I never saw a proof uh, that I could really understand. It's just folklore. So I'm drawing your attention. So, okay. So anyway, I don't know how to do that. But of course, since I'm working on it, I had to devise a new proof. And so the Euler equation, I just don't know how to use it. Now, as everyone knows, there's an alternative approach problems with calcium variation, which is what is called the royal road of Caratheodori, which goes in introducing the optimal value and the hamilton jacob equation. Well, this was introduced by Caratheodori, and you find it, for instance, in the famous book that Stefan has quoted, Calculus Variations Partial Differential Equations. Caratheodori says, consider the optimal value v, uh, for, as this was integral, as a function of the initial point. If v c1 is must satisfy the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, this is the content of his thing. In a moment, I'm going to perform the maximum with respect to c, right? Do I do it in the next slide? And uh, note immediately that I need a boundary condition. So to describe the situation, if k of t converges to k infinity, as it is here, then v of k infinity, at k infinity consumption, it's a fixed point, right? A stationary point. And c infinity is just equal to k infinity. And v of k infinity should be equal, so this doesn't work, 1 over delta u of c infinity, which is itself f of k infinity. So there is a boundary condition. Yeah? Mm? 
maximum over C. Ah, yes, this is uh, what I called, uh, sorry again, imperfect my slide, this is the integral from zero to infinity. Yeah, let me write here. Uh, again, imperfection of my slides. I, these are the kind of thing I would have corrected. But thank you for asking. V of k, zero, equals supremum, because you still don't know if it is attained, of the following quantity, integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus delta t u of c of t, dt, starting from k zero, from k of zero, equals k zero, plus the dynamics. It is what you call the value of the problem. So the maximum you, that you can achieve while respecting the dynamics of the system, Equina did not write, and starting from K0. A classical object in the category of variations, which Lagrange uh, did not uh, introduce, I think, uh, actually, I don't know who introduced it first, certainly Caratheodori uses it, and uh, I think Hamilton uses it, and it is a value that you can the best value they can achieve when starting from K0. The value of the problem, the optimum value as a function of the initial point. Now, it has to satisfy this equation, but in the next slide, you see max, you see C comes here, U of C minus C V prime. So in the next slide, I'm going to perform the maximization. So that is the first order equation. So next slide, I write that in a more familiar form by introducing this is, you see, the maximum it uh, performed with respect to C. I performed the maximum, so given a concave function U. This is very difficult for me because I'm in convex analysis, I deal with convex functions. So if you deal with concave functions, I'm totally lost. So if you perform this kind of maximization, then you get another function which is convex, and you can go back to the other. It's a kind, it's a kind of Legendre transform. And then you can write this is in this form. This is the new form of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And you have the very famous verification, called the verification theorem, which is due to Cara Theodori, very easy proof, and that says that see if uh, so HJB has a C2 solution is equivalent to, there is an optimal solution, and the optimal solution is described as follows, dk over dt equals f of k minus sigma of k, k of 0 equals k0, and uh, sigma, and uh, yes, gradient u of sigma of k equals k. So I'm being rough here. Okay? How does that mean? So that means basically that is a strategy. You have to play 
at, if you are at point, it's the Markovian strategy. If you are at, time, at point k, if your amount of capital at time k is, if your amount of capital at time t, uh, t is k, then you have to consume sigma of k. Right? This is the amount, so this is basically I describe a c equals sigma of k. It is a f what is called a feedback or a closed loop solution. And this describes the solution gradient of V. Ah, excuse me. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, No, 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 no. Yeah. Here it is, excuse me. Excuse me. It's not K, it's V prime of K. And if you know V, you can compute the optimal strategy. So the value function gives you everything. Now something I want to stress here is that for this equation to make sense, I need sigma to be C1. Because otherwise, it simply continues, I don't know if this has solutions, or single solution. So I need sigma to be C1. And because of that, I need V to be C2. Right? And now it seems very easy. Just go back and solve the Hamilton Jacobi equation. You see? Here it is. You say, oh, nothing. It's one dimension. You just solve. It's V prime of k, it's an ordinary differential equation. V prime of k equals something with this boundary condition. Trivial. Well, perhaps not so, because notice it is not solved with respect to V prime. Right? It is not V prime equal. Well, you say, well, just solve it. Okay, let's solve it. So this is an implicit or ordinary differential equation. Now, the only person I know who studied implicit ordinary differential equations is René Tom. And I'm very happy that I have the collected works of René Tom that uh, you can have, I think, freely at the IHES. But you see, so this is the equation that you have to solve. Delta V of K is U star V prime of K plus F of K V prime of K. Fine, but what was U star? U star, so this certainly, this expression here, here is V prime of K, is certainly bigger than the minimum of this quantity with respect to X. But this minimum is known, it is U of F K of X. Because of the relation that I have here. Right? This is that. So, the equation which is here, which I'm going to rewrite. Yeah. Yes, so I have to solve delta V of K equals something U star of V prime of K plus F of K V prime and this is bigger than U of F of K. So there are three cases, you see. Uh, how can I best put it? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, for, I know I'm always very bad at the blackboard. What can I do here? Uh, yes, uh, what, uh, yeah. So, let me keep that. So let me put here, let me plot 
the function u star of x plus f of k of x. Let me plot that function. Well, u star is a convex function. And, and uh, so it depends on k. And here is this function. It's convex. Its minimum is here. The minimum is known. Here you have u of f of k. Depends only on k. Now, I want v. Now I have to plot v. Where is v? So suppose v is here. I have two intersection points. So if delta v is bigger than u of f of k, right? If delta v is bigger than u of f of k, then I get two solutions. So there are two possible solutions for v prime. Delta v. If delta v is smaller, then there is no solution. I cannot solve with respect to v prime. Right? And if you're in bad luck, and if delta v equals u of f of k, you're precisely, you have just one solution, and obviously it's degenerate. So this is what Tom called an implicit ordinary differential equation. You can see it on the plane here as in a nap and so on. Two solutions here, nothing there and so on. Now you hope to God, let's hope we're here. You look at your boundary condition. Here it is. V Delta V equals 1 over delta U of C infinity, but C infinity is F of K infinity. So you're right, but on the wrong place. C equals F of K. Clear? So it is not an initial value problem. Am I clear, Stefan? And I find this very nice. Again, I think Lagrange would have followed that. It's very nice geometry. So, which shows that it's a difficult problem. How do you solve it? Well, you see, can see the condition now. This is what I wrote here. And now, let's look at the phase space. So here's the phase space. K, V. The phase space, I remind you, that the phase space for Hamilton Jacobi. And Hamilton Jacobi is this guy. So it's a phase space for this equation. U star is known, f of k is known. So it's an equation for v as a function of k prime. So the phase space as follows. Here is the equation v equals u of f of k. If you are in the upper region, If you are in the upper region here, there are two possible values for v prime. v prime 1, v prime 2. If you are in that region here, no solution. If you are here, there is one solution 
which is not zero. Right? Here it is, which is not zero. So here it is. Bang. Okay. So how do you solve it? Well, here is a picture. And it's a very nice picture. And you can find the detailed proofs on my website. There is, a, which is www.seremad.dauphine.fr Eckland. And Mariano will <laughs> tell you precisely there is a paper called From Ramsey to Tom. All the proofs are there. And if it goes as follows. Here you have this. Here, of course, so here you have that. So here it goes. These are, I don't have time to give the proof, it is a very nice proof which Lagrange have understood, and it is a rebroussement de première espèce, meaning that both curves, the curves are uh, on both sides of a common tangent. And the question now is, remind the theorem, does this guy have a C2 solution? You need a C2 solution. Here, obviously not. But what happens? At the point where f prime of k bar equals delta, then you have something like that. Uh, yeah, it's probably like that, excuse me. At this point, and at this point only, you have a C2 solution. And this proof Lagrange would not have understood because it requires a central manifold theorem. Right? So this is a central manifold theorem. And using the central manifold theorem, finally, you are able to say that only at the point of prime of k bar equals zero can you find a C2 solution, and then you can apply the verification theorem, and everything fits nice and dandy. Which is much, much more complicated, of course, than using the transversality condition at infinity. However, I still would like a proof of the transversality condition at infinity. Okay. Now, it's just the, so it's very nice geometry. Is that useful? Why did I run into that? Well, as I told you, I'm working on sustainable development, and this uh, in an earlier paper of mine. And in sustainable development, remember the Ramsey model, phase space, so here it is. And in sustainable development, you want to say there is a concern for future generations. Think at climate change. Well, personally, I could say I don't care about climate change because I'm not going to suffer. Okay? If in this room anyone is less than 30, he or she might suffer. But the others. So as far as I'm concerned, no, I mean, it is a fact. Right? So I see some people smiling, but don't smile. It is a fact that people in power will not have to suffer. And uh, people always say, yes, but their children. No, 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 no. Not your own children. The majority of people would be people whom you don't like. Perhaps you don't like the color of their skin. Most of the people will not be white. They may be of a religion you don't want. Right? So. You are asked to do sacrifices now for people whom you don't have especially sympathy for. Think of it. And ask yourself after that why people are not doing anything about climate change. So, it is not, my, I think this is why, but it is my own belief is it's an ethical problem. And anyway, you have to add a term that expresses your concern for the future. Here, the a to the minus delta t kills all concern for the future. 
because if you, if you take delta like 4% with the current age, then anything that happens 100 years from now is discounted away. It doesn't matter. The price of climate, at, at 4%, the pl price of climate change is basically zero. So you're not going to invest anything. Now you add a term here that says, I'm interested in C infinity. I'm interested in that guy. I want I want to shift that point somewhere here or somewhere here. So this is an idea that is due to Shishilnitsky, but no one has been able to make anything out of it because if you ask that question, then the answer is obvious. The optimal solution is plus infinity. Why is that so? Well, well, very easy. Just say, let's reduce our standard of living and live on bread and water for 20,000 years. Then you can increase, you can save a lot. You increase, you increase, you increase. And if you increase a lot, then the term here can be made as large as you wish. While this term is still positive, with some u. So you make that term as large as you wish, so you can get plus infinity. So we, let's say for two million years, in two million years, our descendants will be able to consume a lot. And even if alpha is 0.1%, since it's positive, it's going to beat anything. Super plus infinity. What's the problem, the economic problem with that strategy? Well, the economic problem with that strategy is that simply won't do it. Right? Why should I save now? It's always, you see, I can say, that's a great idea, let's all do it. But then we think a little bit, no. Why we? Our ch children will do it. It's a great idea. But right now, let our children do it. If you don't do it now, but you do it in 10 years, you're not going to change that limit. Right? It's a limit. Whatever you do in finite time will not affect the limit. It's all, uh, someone else will start. And everyone else thinks that someone else will do it, and no one does it. So, this is something that has arisen in economics now, which is optimality. When you, optimality is interesting where there's one person who decides. But in long-term situation where several, peop, several generations come in, optimality is useless. Because each generation has to find his or her own interest to do it, do it now. The problem is not to find something that is good to do. The problem is to find something that is good to do and do it now. So optimality is not a good concept. So you need another concept. And this concept has been introduced in discrete time by other people, it has been very much studied. There is a paper by myself and Lazrak about it to introduce the concept of equilibrium solution. So, the definition is here, as you can see. <laughs> so, I am now it's cut, but I'm, so we don't have time, so I'm not going to describe it in detail. I'm just going to say what it is. A strategy sigma. C equals sigma is an equilibrium if, if what? Well, if you have an interest in doing it now, provided everyone else is doing it. Example. We announce a policy. The government today say, this is what we're going to do about climate change. Fine. Then you sit down with your friends and you say, well, should we wait or should do it now? You do your computations and you find out that it's good for you to do it now. For you, not for generations. But how do you know what your children and the other will do? Well, you say, we assume that they will still be doing what is decided. And when they do their own computation, they'll find it is in their own interest to do it. In other words, it is a strategy it's called an equilibrium strategy. Unilateral deviations are punished. If everyone else is doing it, you should do it. <coughs> if every, every generation do it, 
If, if you think that everyone, every generation will do it, it is in your interest to do it and do it now. <coughs> Fine. Example of something which is not an equilibrium. You've seen, I say, well, I have to start running. And then I say, uh, well, uh, it will, uh, I do my computation, whichever, and I find it's very good to do running, it makes it good, good for my health and so on. It's not good to do it today, it's much better to do it tomorrow. So I decide to start running tomorrow. Of course, when tomorrow comes, tomorrow is today and it's good to do it tomorrow. So this is not an equilibrium. An equilibrium is, I decide to do something and I find that it is in my interest to do it now. So you have a characterization, and uh, this is the result I have with Yiming and Jinlong. You find that equilibrium strategies are described by an, uh, the hamilton jacobi equation with another boundary condition. The boundary condition is not, oh yes, there is a logarithm here because I did the computation with u equals log. But instead of having 1 over delta, you have 1 over 1 minus alpha delta. Alpha is the importance you attach to the future. So the boundary condition is different. So in a way it's very nice because you see V equals uh, 1 uh, over, <coughs> yeah, so, you, so this, that basically tells you so that tells you that basically the equation is u prime of c infinity u prime of f. So, uh, yeah, but anyway. So what that does is that because of the delta, you can move away from this and go to somewhere here. Now all this is accessible. So I can ta I can turn. I can pick now any k infinity here, and this is the boundary value problem I have to solve. Unfortunately, you see, I can solve it on one side but not the other. It is one-sided. <coughs> and now, here is the end of the matter. Let me go back to the picture. So you may wonder about this picture, but look at it. Let me try to put, remember this picture? Right? Let's try to put the two together. Remember they both have K downstairs. So let me try to put one picture on the other. Uh, how can I see? Uh, yes, so that is, the other picture looked like something like that. So you see, I don't know if I can carry it, the value is an integral along this curve, right? So k is here, so that is the solution of Euler equation, and this is the value. So you see the solution is only on one side, and the v then is here. So in other words, this is a projection of something smooth upstairs somehow. And so here is our solution, going here. <coughs> you can achieve this point. If you start from a, if you start, oh yeah, let's start, uh, yeah, so here's our solution. If you start from here, you can achieve this value. How can you achieve it? If you start higher, you can go down and stay here. However, you cannot go below a front of k bar. So if you start from that point, you go this way, all the way, business as usual. In other words, we're saying the following. Well. If 
if you accept this criterion, and if you take alpha very large, for instance, you have a lot of concern for future generations. If you are in a growing economy, then even if you have a very large alpha, you will go all the way. Business as usual. No amount of concern for future generations will help you to stop before that. On the other hand, if you start with very high levels of capital, does that ever happen? Yes. For instance, think at environmental resources. Suppose you live in a big forest. In the other regions of the world, like Brazil, you have big forests. If you start with high level of capitals, you, cannot, you can stop before you go to business as usual. You can do something. Or if you start to, with carbon, for instance, you want to keep low the carbon, then you can uh, stop before that. That means you can do something and stop uh, and do some other policies and business as usual. But you can never go back. You will never be able to retrieve the old levels of carbon, or you'll never be able to rebuild the Antonio forest, and so on. So, you see, all this, by considering a very simple problem in the one-dimensional calculus variations. The mathematics, notably the use of the central limit of the central manifold theorem, took me a lot of time and a lot of going to dynamical systems. But if we had, if Lagrange had done his work and had written down the transversality condition infinity, then it would have been much easier. Or perhaps we should work ourselves. Thank you very much. To the chairman to ask questions. For? Global war? Oh, I mean, it's a very simple model, right? Of course. But oh, my conclusion is we're going into the wall. And that's what you're going into the wall. Into the wall. But for other reasons. I mean, this is a very simple model. But I mean, I just, with all the things that go into that? Two? No. Uh, lose a fight, I mean. <laughs> lose a fight. I don't know, I mean, it's a simple model. The purpose of this model is to tell you that there is inertia. Yeah. Not only in the physical world, but in the social world. The fact that the question, why should the present generation make sacrifices and why does it not wait for others to do it, is central also in politics. You see it all the time. China is asking, why should we make the sacrifices also? Right? No, no. This is who is going to... So this is just... Shall we say this is just one more problem of global warming? Well, let me remind you, for instance, that uh, the latest... Uh, uh, the uh, and the, uh, but uh, uh, the latest, we have lots of predictions, so uh, there should be no ice on the polar cap in 2030 or even earlier, and so on. And by that time, I think the United Nations or some big body is saying that the, the, the summer temperature around the Mediterranean uh, will rise by 9 degrees. Right? But I will not be there. And the people who govern us will likely not be there either. And I just, uh, oh, but anyway, the world is full of surprises. But uh, and you see in practice that the negotiations are going nowhere. On that optimistic note, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>